Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for your patience. The train from Delaware was running a, a, a tad late, um, so not the fault of our, our speaker today. I uh, just want to welcome you here to CSIS. My name is Jennifer Cook. I'm director of the Africa program here. And I'd like to welcome you. Oops, I'm getting a signal. I can't tell from my glasses. Talking to the mic? Is that okay? Um, welcome you here today uh, for a discussion on um, East Africa. Uh, Senator Coons will reflect um, on his recent trip to East Africa, where he visited Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania. Um, we're really delighted to have him here. Uh, Senator Coons is a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, he's chair of the Foreign Relations Subcommittee on African Affairs. I have to say, um, it's really been uh, a delight to have you in that position. Um, the energy and passion on, I think, leadership on issues of governance, of security, of development, and the connections among all of these um, it has been very important. And an advocate, I think, for a very smart, uh, sustained U.S. engagement in Africa and, and the new and evolving ways that we need to engage with Africa to stay relevant in a changing uh, global um, and African context. Um, so his work uh, uh, in encouraging investment and trade, I think, has been extremely important and timely. Uh, East Africa, where the senator recently traveled, uh, has become of uh, re really much greater significance in U.S. policy calculations in Africa. Uh, each of the countries visited, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, um, have in their own ways been important partners to the United States. Each faced distinct challenges in security, development, and governance. Uh, they're all significant recipients of U.S. assistance, uh, all three big partners in PEPFAR, uh, Tanzania in the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Uh, in security, Kenya and Uganda in particular uh, have been important players in the fight against al-Shabaab in Somalia, uh, which threatens not only Somali uh, populations but the region at large. And in governance, each faces distinct uh, challenges. Uh, Uganda um, uh, essentially uh, remains, unfortunately, an authoritarian state under the 26-year rule of President Museveni. Kenya, in which uh, democratic norms are probably more firmly in, in, entrenched, uh, nonetheless is facing big challenges of potential volatility, violence in the lead up to these elections, and has a major political restructuring underway um, given the passage of the con new constitution last year. And Tanzania, which has been a kind of a stable, uh, stable country, is, is, is the focus is more in terms of curbing corruption, and in terms of making Tanzania um, a more uh, attractive and, uh, investment environment and so forth. So, um, uh, the Senator's trip was brief, but I think he got some uh, good conversations on all of these topics. I'll turn it over to him, and then we'll leave as much time as we can for question and answer and discussion. So, Senator, welcome, and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you so much uh, for CSIS's leadership in this area in making sure that uh, for 50 years now uh, in Washington and around the world, uh, we are able to participate in a thoughtful and balanced and mature dialogue on important issues of uh, defense and security and uh, how we balance uh, our values and uh, our priorities around the world. We had the pleasure of welcoming Jennifer to testify uh, in front of the Senate of Foreign Relations uh, area at the Africa Subcommittee as a witness. Uh, and I'm grateful for her many contributions, as well as for the CSAS uh, Africa program and its contributions to the discourse on African affairs uh, here in Washington and elsewhere. Uh, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, uh, I have the honor in this Congress, the 112th, of chairing the Africa Subcommittee. And I hope to continue to have that honor in future Congresses. We will see. Uh, I am succeeding uh, Senator Russ Feingold of Wisconsin, who for nearly a decade served the same role uh, very admirably and I think helped convene uh, a responsible and sustained conversation uh, and engagement by the United States and Africa. And in my current work, I am truly blessed to have Senator Johnny Isaacson of Georgia as my ranking minority. Uh, I call him my co-chair because uh, the two of us and our staff work so closely and so positively uh, together in an environment in Washington where bipartisanship uh, is more recognized uh, for its occasional outbreaks than for its predominance in conversation. Uh, Senator Isaacson and I and our staff, uh, Haley Seufer, who's here with me, my foreign policy LA, uh, and his, uh, Sully, uh, have worked remarkably well together, and that has made this uh, even more important. 
Uh, Jennifer wrote uh, recently uh, an important piece uh, called Changing the Narrative, uh, and I will try and use that in part as the theme as we talk about uh, U.S.-Africa relations, particularly in the East African context today, because uh, at a time of constrained budgets, at a time uh, when the United States media uh, is less and less investing uh, in direct re reporting uh, from the continent, and at a time when there are very important developments across the continent, I do think it is critical for us uh, to change the narrative uh, within the United States, within our private sector, our nonprofit sector, broadly in our country, uh, about uh, the future of Africa and the enormous promise contained within Africa. Uh, last month, as you heard, uh, I had the first opportunity to return to East Africa since a semester spent there 28 years ago as an undergraduate at the University of Nairobi and since I was last there 25 years ago uh, as a relief worker uh, with the Presbyterian Church of East Africa uh, and helping in an orphanage in Ngong. Uh, it is striking to me both how much has changed and how much hasn't. Uh, the skyscrapers of Kampala and Dar es Salaam were unrecognizable when I was last in Kampala it had been uh, torn apart by a very difficult civil war. Uh, and Dar es Salaam at that point <clears throat> was the leading city in a nation that, whose economy was almost completely flattened uh, by Ujamaa socialism, which had failed to deliver uh, sustained economic growth. Uh, on the other hand, some things haven't changed at all. President Museveni uh, had, in 1987, just arrived uh, in the capital city, and I had an opportunity to meet with him just a few weeks ago. And as Jennifer mentioned in the opening, he is still there as the president today. <laughs> Uh, as I stood at the corner of Uhuru Park in downtown Nairobi, uh, there were a number of sort of marked symbols that were still easily recognizable, but they were surrounded uh, by a thicket of new skyscrapers and by a throng of nearly a million new vehicles, it seemed. Uh, the challenges of Mathari Valley uh, remain there even more deeply and robustly than they were before and more painfully, uh, but the opportunity uh, of an emerging middle class, uh, of a steady but slow progress towards democracy and transparency across the region, uh, and the promises of regionalism uh, are all things that struck me uh, in this visit of uh, just a week or so. It is clear to me uh, that the African people uh, continue to hold a remarkable uh, culture, a commitment to family, to each other, uh, to faith uh, that I spoke about at the prayer breakfast in Nairobi uh, that touched me deeply in those two visits 25 and 28 years ago and that still strikes me today uh, as being something from which the people of the United States could learn and should learn. Uh, but there are also significant structural challenges uh, to their making full progress and participating in the promise of the modern world and of democracy and of the opportunities uh, that a fully integrated uh, modern global economy will hold out for them. So uh, let's take then, if we could, a few moments to talk about what I see as the three main strands. Uh, in the first homestay family uh, that I stayed with just uh, north of Lake Victoria uh, in a very tiny rural, rural town about 100 miles uh, north of Kisumu, uh, there was a saying on the wall, which I won't get right. I won't try to repeat it in Kiswahili. Uh, but it essentially said that there are three chords in this marriage. There is the husband, the wife, and God. And that the three of them, any one of them might uh, fail to stand, but the three of them woven together into a common chord uh, were unbreakable. And so that family often referred to uh, the three strands of a woven rope of a cord, that if straight and taut and woven finely, uh, was nearly unbreakable, but any one of those three was not sufficient or strong enough uh, on itself. So security, governance, economic growth struck me as themes uh, that were interwoven both across these three countries and across the region uh, and that were highlighted uh, as being at the center of a myriad of issues, uh, a web of issues uh, that uh, challenge uh, and lift up uh, the people of East Africa. In order to be successful, in my view, we have to look at all three of these in series, each uh, within the countries in their own context, but also in a regional context, uh, to do the best job we possibly can to be strong and effective and vital allies and partners uh, with the people of East Africa and the people of the continent uh, as they seek solutions to the challenges uh, that face them today and going forward. I also see these three as inextricably linked. Security, of course, uh, as Jennifer mentioned, is an enormous challenge for the continent and for the region. And while relative stability uh, has returned to Uganda uh, as the Lord's Resistance Army, which had long caused enormous human suffering in northern Uganda, uh, has largely been removed uh, from the region, is now in sort of remote corners of Central African Republic, South Sudan, and the DRC. Um, the work of reconstruction, of restoration, and of healing of whole communities, as expensive, as difficult, as long, and as work in which uh, the United States government, our NGO partners, the faith community are actively engaged. And so on one level, uh, one, of the most secure, one of the most encouraging things uh, for me to see 
uh, was the steady uh, progress we're making, uh, both in a regional effort uh, to remove Joseph Kony and his uh, commanders from the battlefield, uh, the central role that the United States military is playing in training, in providing equipment, in providing uh, resources and intelligence uh, to that effort, uh, but also the real leadership uh, shown by the AU and by the Ugandans uh, in an effort that is African-led. If you look around the region, uh, it is even more true uh, that the potential sources of regional instability, the ongoing and worsening conflict between Sudan and South Sudan, uh, the very real challenges al-Shabaab poses to security and stability in Somalia, a country that for two decades has known neither, uh, and the very real human rights abuses and insecurity in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, all around this central core of the three East African community uh, core countries, uh, there are sources of great instability. There are also potential solutions to these sources of instability, where regional efforts led by the AU led by Kenya and Uganda, and to some smaller extent Tanzania, can help push back on Somali piracy, uh, on insecurity and instability on the borders, uh, on the very real challenges that the DRC has posed and its conflicts have posed to Rwanda and Burundi and others, uh, and on the very real challenge, the very real possibility that Sudan and South Sudan currently engaged in an unproductive mutual death grip uh, may cause a downward spiral and another failed state in the region. More positively, uh, shared resources in terms of intelligence, training, and planning uh, have produced AU-led and UN-sanctioned uh, initiatives and efforts in the region uh, that have stabilized the security situation and made possible um, some of the most robust growth on the entire continent. Uh, Tanzania uh, is a country that has relatively few, if any, significant security issues, and in Kenya, its major security challenge is on its border with Somalia and the ongoing threats uh, of al-Shabaab actions uh, within the country. It was hard to miss this fact because just the day before we arrived, a bomb went off in downtown Nairobi, and it sort of dominated many of the conversations and news, and the ongoing uh, Kenyan action uh, was, uh, the week after we left, officially uh, folded into Amisom uh, with the signing of an MOU uh, and the uh, sort of rationalization of a regional effort uh, that will combine Ethiopians, Ugandans, Burundians, and Kenyans uh, in a well-planned and I hope well-executed uh, effort to not just remove al-Shabaab but also replace with Somali institutions and Somali uh, democratic uh, leadership. So security is the first of three strands that regionally is absolutely essential to making uh, any progress on the other key strands. Um, a second strand, if I could, that I wanted to touch on uh, for a few minutes today uh, was in economic development. Uh, because in my view, economic development critically undergirds and underscores the possibilities and the hope uh, for democracy and good governance. Economic development is one area where this region has done remarkably well over the last 25 years, and we see enormous uh, prospects for progress. Uh, great recent discoveries in natural resources hold both uh, promise and threat. Uh, much of the growth in Africa, just on a percentage basis and on a, on a uh, total basis, uh, has been in extractive uh, industries, and the challenge is to continue diversification into manufacturing, into services, into infrastructure, into IT. Uh, and one of the enormous opportunities uh, that exists across the continent is a generation of young people, many of whom are beginning to reverse a decades-old trend of brain drain, of going uh, to the United States and other countries to pursue higher education and not returning. Uh, one of the most encouraging uh, meetings that I had while I was there uh, was with a promising, innovative, impressive group of young people, many of whom had been educated in the UK or in the United States and had chosen to return to Nairobi. Uh, one group had started an IT community called the iHub. Another uh, had chosen to start a grassroots uh, effort called Eco Sandals in Mathari Valley that was locally owned and locally led, taking advantage of AGOA uh, to export. Uh, truly fashionable, you can find them at ecosandals.com. Um, footwear, there's a truly amusing um, photo of me in suit and tie donning my Eco Sandals. Uh, and we had similar conversations uh, with uh, professors and young people uh, in Kampala about their local chapters that works in partnership with Engineers Without Borders from UC Davis, uh, and young entrepreneurs who are investing in infrastructure and energy uh, in Tanzania in a conversation in DAR. Um, all of these suggest that in many ways Africa's most precious resource and potential for opportunity, both in market and in market drivers, is its people. And if we can engage in real partnership with Africa in a way that deploys some of our greatest resources, our world-class universities, our emerging capacity at distance learning, our ability uh, to deliver on, uh, pro um, on programs and performance and mid-level management, and I don't mean bureaucracy necessarily, uh, 
um, we can help to strengthen the groundwork uh, on which sustained, positive, inclusive economic growth uh, can occur. One of the things that was most impressive uh, to me about Tanzania uh, was how positive the relationship remains between the United States and Tanzania. Um, having no significant security challenges, having stable democracy and governance, uh, has allowed Tanzania to be one of our strongest partners in the Millennium Challenge Compact. And we had the opportunity to see uh, some of those projects and how they are actually playing out on the ground. That $700 million compact, one of the largest in the MCC's history, is addressing fundamental issues for their economy, uh, the infrastructure for the distribution of energy. And I was encouraged by the very real partnership we see between the United States and Tanzania, the efforts they're making to combat corruption, uh, the investment that they are making as a nation in partnering with us and delivering on the MCC uh, work. Uh, and I was encouraged to see some Delaware companies uh, successfully exporting chicken to Zanzibar uh, and developing uh, new seed hybrids uh, for distribution uh, through a Feed the Future partnership across the country. There are enormous tracts of arable land uh, in Africa that are underutilized, and there is real opportunity here for a partnership between the United States, our research universities, the ministries of agriculture, uh, and the emerging uh, leadership of the region uh, to make a fundamental difference in a way that hasn't happened over the last 25 years. Africa is one of the few places in the world uh, where the remaining key security question is food insecurity and health insecurity and where the United States has made critical investments uh, to make progress on both of those. The last and most vital strand, I think, of the three is in governance. And this was our main focus in Kenya. Uh, whereas Jennifer mentioned in the introduction, uh, in the run-up to next year's elections, there is and should be a primary focus uh, by the international community in supporting those voices within Kenyan society, in the press, in the nonprofit sector, in the faith community, and in government, who are willing to stand up and work and fight and assert the primacy of Kenya as opposed to any particular region or group or ethnicity. This will be a great challenge. I think the 2013 elections will be an absolutely essential turning point uh, for the people in the nation of Kenya. Uh, and I was encouraged to meet with some terrific and impressive people, Speaker of the Parliament, Kenneth Merende, uh, and to speak with Chief Justice Willie Matunga, both of whom are willing to take real risks in order to press forward on building independent institutions. Without a free press, without an independent judiciary, without a legislative body that can hold the executive accountable, and without sustained progress towards their remarkable new constitution, which includes the devolution of power from a unitary federal government to counties, something I have long experience in as a 10-year countywide elected official, um, there are real challenges, even in our own country, in making local government transparent and effective and responsive. And I hope that we will continue to sustain our very real investments in working in partnership with the people of Kenya and delivering on that. In a speech that I gave uh, first at the National Prayer Breakfast and then again on a similar topic at the University of Nairobi, my main goal was to reinforce against a broad misperception in the Kenyan public that the United States has no preference for any particular candidate, region, or outcome in the elections, but instead simply supports the process of free, fair, open, and safe elections. This is an important message for us across the continent because there are nations that have moved steadily towards democracy and transparency, and there are nations that recently have slipped backwards uh, where coups and counter coups, where constitutional amendments and uh, elections of questionable legitimacy uh, continue to suggest a backwards trend. One of our greatest partners in this is strong regional institutions. Uh, in the testimony you gave previously about Cote d'Ivoire, the role that ECOWAS has played in Cote d'Ivoire and Mali uh, is a strong suggestion of the vital role that regional institutions can play. The East African community, predominantly an economic uh, institution at this point, is at its nascent stages in having some supportive uh, role to play. It can and should play a central role in reducing trade barriers, in improving regional standards, in streamlining uh, infrastructure and other institutions, but it can and should, along with the AU in Addis, also play a regional role in encouraging democracy and good governance. Mo Ibrahim testified in front of our subcommittee about his prize, and while I know many will not leave uh, the pleasantries of national leadership for a mere five million dollar prize, uh, it suggests an emerging uh, regional, if not continent-wide, cadre of seasoned and secure leaders, the elders, among others, uh, who can call those who have achieved national leadership to hand the reins of power over to a successor peacefully and responsibly. And it is my real hope that President Kabaki, who gave a compelling speech to this effect about his commitment to his lasting legacy after 10 years as president being a final, secure, safe, and appropriate and open election in 2013, 
uh, we can, I hope, then encourage a new generation of leaders, uh, not just in Kenya but across the region, to respect the ICC, to hold accountable those uh, who commit atrocities against their own people, whether they be in Syria uh, or in Cote d'Ivoire, whether they be in Kenya uh, or in other places around the world. Emerging global and regional standards for conduct are critical to having standards for governance and democracy. Transparency is also absolutely critical. And it is key that there be uh, some consequence for those who violate transparency and for those uh, who take actions that push back against our values agenda. One of our best tools in this regard, in my view, is the Millennium Challenge Corporation. And if we are going to change the narrative, if we are going to change uh, from a, a transitory focus where it is really only the crises uh, that attract global attention and that attract the attention of decision makers and policy leaders in the United States, then we need to continue to invest in a mature, balanced, and responsible process where we set clear standards, we encourage uh, countries who are allies and partners uh, to step up and to meet them, and then we invest in responsible and sustained partnership with them towards that. Uh, President Banda of Malawi was just uh, in Washington visiting with a number of us in the past week. Her nation was removed from the list of those eligible to proceed with the Millennium Challenge Corporation because of some regrettable actions uh, that uh, suppressed uh, freedom and openness and that moved backwards in terms of tolerance and openness and accountability. Now that there is a new administration and there's been a transition, they are taking swift and sure action, I believe, uh, in their parliament and in her, with her leadership to get back to being a country uh, that is deserving of a strong investment in partnership with the United States and of strong multilateral regard. We also have to make sure uh, that the investments that we are able to make as a nation are sustainable. In this time when our budgets are under greater stress than ever, uh, when there is less attention being paid to this most important of continents, uh, it is critical that we look hard at our own internal structure for sustaining our investment uh, in defense, in development, uh, and in diplomacy. Uh, I was truly impressed with the caliber of those who represent the United States in the region, from Peace Corps workers to ambassadors, from USAID uh, career employees to those in the faith community and the nonprofit sector who represent us across the continent. Um, we are also at last beginning to engage with those within the United States uh, who have not previously been as fully leveraged as they could or should be. There has been a fundamental shift in the capital flows from the United States to Africa in the last 25 years since I was last there. Instead of the vast majority of uh, investment onto the continent from the United States coming through U.S. government and development and relief funding, it is now overwhelmingly from the private sector. That is as it should be. And as we begin to move from relief and development to investment and trade, uh, it is my very real hope that we will take a harder and closer look to ensure that our development investments are as sustainable and transparent and efficient as they can be. And I want to specifically commend USAID Administrator Raj Shah for some very tough decisions in this regard uh, that are not easy, uh, but that are geared towards making our investments uh, responsible and sustainable. And I also want to make sure that we continue as a community and dialogue here in Washington to remember to engage the states from which our representatives come and to engage our media and to challenge them to focus uh, on the positive stories across these three strands, across security, democracy and governance, and economic development, because there is enormous opportunity on this continent. We can sustain our investment, and we can take advantage of the huge opportunities that it poses. As I suppose everyone in this room knows, uh, six out of 10 of the fastest growing economies in the world were on the African continent in the last decade, and it's likely to be seven out of 10 in the next decade. All of these sustained positive um, changes can be strengthened if we work together as a country and as a community. And I was very pleased uh, with the White House strategy that was just released this week, uh, this new uh, presidential policy directive uh, on U.S. strategy towards sub-Saharan Africa, um, highlights a renewed commitment by this administration uh, to an all-of-government approach. It is my hope that we will see that delivered upon, um, that we will see a more robust engagement by the Department of Commerce in particular, uh, which I frankly think has been sadly missing uh, from many of our critical efforts in the continent, and that we will begin to see a more coordinated effort between EXIM, OPIC, the Trade and Development Administration, USTR, Department of Commerce, uh, with our lead agencies, USAID and state, both of which have done, uh, I think, a strong and admirable job in, in facing up to the challenges of the continent and in strengthening and supporting our allies in the continent. Um, there are reasons why um, those of us in the Congress, despite uh, blinding partisanship at times, uh, have some optimism about the prospects for progress. 
Uh, Senator Isaacson and I paired with our Republican and Democratic uh, compatriots over in the House, uh, Congressman Smith and Congresswoman Bass, in all four of us presenting to the AGOA conference, uh, our assurance uh, of our continued and tireless effort to renew the AGOA third party fabric agreement. Uh, it is frustrating to all four of us that it has taken this long in order to get this non controversial and essential provision uh, renewed, but I am confident that this will happen and happen soon, and that leaders in both bodies are well aware. Uh, that tens of thousands of jobs, predominantly of women, predominantly in the least developed and most remote countries in Africa, uh, are at stake if we fail to make sustained progress in this. AGOA and the AGOA Third Party Fabric Agreement are just the beginning. We need a stronger, broader, and more robust trade relationship, uh, one that opens up broader opportunities, one that provides stronger resources uh, to the African continent in order that we can uh, sustain a flourishing trade relationship. The United States has been eclipsed by China as Africa's main trading partner just in the last two years. Uh, and this is a moment, a moment when we should reflect and a moment when I think we should renew and redouble our effort. Uh, buried within uh, the policy document released uh, by the President uh, is a reference to a new Doing Business with Africa campaign that will harness the resources of the U.S. government and the African diaspora community within the United States. Uh, I've introduced a bill along with uh, Senator Durbin, who is the lead sponsor, Senators Isaacson and Bozeman, called the Increasing American Jobs Through Greater Exports to Africa Act, which I am hopeful we will take up and act upon soon, but that reinforces this fundamental policy direction uh, by the White House. As the White House policy directive makes clear, um, quote, sustainable inclusive economic growth is a key ingredient to security, political stability, and development, and underpins efforts to alleviate poverty, creating the resources that will bolster opportunity and allow individuals to reach their full potential. There are so many other topics and issues on which we touched during my visit to East Africa and which I could have discussed today. Conservation. There is a critical loss uh, of world historic uh, wildlife uh, in East Africa and across the continent going on now. Uh, there is a real risk that security and stability issues, governance issues are going to have a tragic impact uh, on world-class wildlife. So conservation, poverty alleviation, helping millions of human beings gradually move to a place of security and stability in food and health, climate change, uh, and the importance of, in particularly fragile areas around the continent, making sure that we build resiliency uh, into economies, such as the Horn of Africa, where we've seen a tragic famine, and the Sahel region uh, in the west of Africa, where we are seeing a rapidly emerging uh, famine, where I believe climate change plays some important role. Across all of these fields, health and food, strengthening and sustaining conservation, uh, and stability, um, there are three core strands. And if we can but straighten them, wrap them together with regional institutions, and sustain our investment in them, I do think that a focus on security, on democracy and strong institutions, and on economic growth that is inclusive, and that is balanced, and that is open for all, will make steady and remarkable progress. It is my firm and fond hope that it will not be 25 years until my next visit to East Africa. It is my hope it will be but two or three years at most. And it is my very real hope that after successful, open, free, and fair elections in 2013, and after successful implementation of a record MCC compact, and after successful movement towards a more open uh, and robust democratic environment in Uganda, we will see a region that is more integrated, that is more secure, that is more democratic, and that has much more opportunity for the people of East Africa. Thank you. If you'd like to stand there so I, I can say you I think I'm going to take some questions. <laughs> I think that's easy to see. Please, if you want. Yes, you. And could you tell me just your name and who you, where you're from? And we have microphones. Uh, I'm, I'm, my name is Shamis Abdullah. I'm a founder of Zanzibar American Diaspora Association. Uh, I had a wonderful visit to Zanzibar. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> there is a big concern now in Zanzibar about uh, this new constitutional review, which President Kikwete just announced recently. Yes. About the voice of Zanzibar will be very much shut, and mm. especially since 1995, there's a big disappointment for mostly uh, Zanzibari academic overseas and the people of Zanzibar about the democracy in Zanzibar. People feel like many people now seeking referendum, Zanzibar to be part 
of East African community as an independent nation. And a lot of people worried about this voice will be shut the same way we happen like now we see in Egypt. It's like there will be no really democracy in the island. As you know, <coughs> multi-party just came out in Tanzania a few years ago, but really America support uh, Zanzibar be part of East African community if people are allowed to vote for referendum. It's great when these microphones are on, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I had the opportunity to visit uh, with Zanzibar's president, uh, to be reminded of the long and strong history of Zanzibar being the second nation to recognize the United States in the early 19th century, uh, and to get a better um, sense of the distinctions uh, between Zanzibari uh, culture and political traditions uh, and concerns and the mainland. Uh, and I do think that very delicate balance between Zanzibar uh, and the rest of Tanzania in a federal republic uh, is a domestic question, is an internal question, but one that must be resolved in free and fair and open processes, and one where referenda uh, and open dialogue and discourse and the democratic process is the best path forward. Uh, your reference to unfolding events in Egypt is an important one. Uh, at a time when the whole region of northern Africa uh, has been lifted up by very real um, opportunities and prospects for voices to be heard and for democracy to break out, uh, it has also produced uh, some challenges in terms of instability. I think that the best path forward for Zanzibar, for Tanzania, and for the region is to also be attentive to the process of democracy and openness, but to development and opportunity, because millions of young people uh, will not continue to uh, be optimistic and hopeful and engaged uh, and support democratic processes if they don't have both economic opportunity and security. These will be very difficult to deliver. Uh, in the context of Tunisia and Egypt and uh, other countries, and equally so in Zanzibar uh, and through the Federal Republic of Tanzania. So thank you for your question. I would expect the United States to support free, fair, and open processes to resolve this difficult question that is, was so closely decided uh, in your last elections. Please, if I could. And who are you and where are you yeah, from? And if you could wait for the microphone. <laughs> Although I'm confident we can hear your voice. Jeff. from Capital Research Associates. My question is about South Sudan. First, is South Sudan in any kind of official basis considered part of East Africa? Secondly, uh, if you can comment, and I know you don't have the several hours it would require, comment on the prospects for South Sudan. And third, what is the U.S. doing and what should we be doing vis-a-vis -vis South Sudan? A, a great question. Uh, one of the first principles, I think, for senators to say what you don't know. I don't know whether South Sudan is officially considered uh, part of the East African community. I don't think so. Uh, but it is so centrally tied um, through uh, infrastructure uh, and history uh, to Uganda and Kenya and to Ethiopia and other players in the Horn and in the Great Lakes region um, that to neglect to mention it in this context, I think, would have been to overlook uh, a core uh, challenge and opportunity for the region. I was struck uh, at a lunch in Dar es Salaam to hear um, strong uh, regional economic players excited about investing in Juba and excited about the prospects uh, for Juba before uh, this recent um, fight uh, over oil resources. Uh, unfortunately, I think uh, we've seen the two states uh, sort of locked in a death grip uh, that really threatens to spiral both economies into the ground uh, in a way that is really mutually destructive. Princeton Lyman, uh, our special envoy, I think has done uh, a remarkable job. I do think there is, of course, critical and unfinished work uh, in implementing the CPA. And again, back to a, a theme that I wove throughout uh, my remarks was about the importance of regional institutions. Uh, a number of regional governments played a central role in uh, pushing forward uh, a successful uh, referendum, a successful move towards independence for South Sudan, and what should have been a successful resolution to this decades-long conflict. The conflict has reemerged over a couple of key points about borders, about resources, about demilitarization, about revenue um, that were not resolved uh, in the comprehensive uh, peace agreement. And uh, we need those regional players uh, with United States support and assistance to continue to keep these parties coming back to the table. Um, the ICC uh, and the impact of indictments 
uh, as we just saw play out in Malawi and their decisions about hosting the AU conference, uh, I, I think is an important piece of this, but it is a difficult piece of this. And there are different opinions across the region uh, about how it has played. I think it is important to hold uh, Bashir and the Khartoum regime to international standards of conduct. Um, but we need consensus in the region and we need pressure to keep these players at the table. And it's my hope uh, that China will continue to play some constructive role in doing so. I didn't have hours. I hope I gave a, a brief response. Please, if we could over here, I'm just going to try and move across the room. Thank you, Senator. John Doyle with the 4G War Blog. Um, regarding security, one of the three strands uh, uh, that you've used in your very good analogy. Pardon me. Um, the latest uh, Defense Department strategy shift uh, focuses on the Asian Pacific, uh, and I was wondering um, what problems that may present for security in Africa and, and U.S. involvement in that, and, and more particularly, if I could, I don't think I heard you mention U.S. Africa Command at all. Perhaps I missed it. And I'm just wondering if you think they're making any progress in convincing a lot of the people in Africa that they're not some new form of colonialism. Uh, I missed uh, a reference to General uh, Ham and his able leadership of AFRICOM, and so I appreciate the opportunity to, to revisit that topic. Uh, I did spend a half a day uh, in Kampala and Entebbe visiting uh, with our Special Forces Unit um, that is supporting uh, the multilateral effort uh, to remove Joseph Kony and his lieutenants from the battlefield and to strengthen uh, civilian ability uh, to respond and defend against LRA attacks and to deliver uh, some of the regional capabilities uh, also that are relevant to actions by Amazon in Somalia. Uh, I think one of the great things about uh, AFRICOM is that it provides an opportunity in a strategic uh, way to realign resources and to look at our partnerships uh, with the region. Unlike other combatant commands, it doesn't have significant legacy assets um, that need to be restructured in this Pacific pivot. Uh, it does fit what I think is our emerging um, security a framework which is one that prefers multilateral action, um, light footprint by the United States, uh, and deploying our unique uh, assets in support uh, of efforts by our allies. Uh, it is my hope, in fact, my confidence, that we will not be fighting uh, a major land war in Africa anytime soon, um, hopefully no time in my lifetime. Uh, I don't think if you sat here and uh, interviewed this entire room full of folks in 2000, we would have imagined we would be fighting a decade-long uh, war in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, and as we re-examine our security profile, both what we need in terms of national security and defense and what we can sustain in terms of national security and defense, uh, I think AFRICOM, uh, which is you know, still wisely predominantly based out of Europe uh, rather than in some uh, large base on the continent, um, offers a way forward uh, to reimagine uh, our engagement uh, with lots of theaters around the world, uh, whether it's um, South America or Southeast Asia or the continent of Africa, it will take time uh, to persuade African leaders uh, and African communities uh, that AFRICOM uh, is not uh, on its way towards being a combatant command like CENTCOM or like other uh, combatant commands, that it really is designed to facilitate partnership between development, diplomacy, and defense and to work uh, in partnership with and in support of our regional allies as they, as they pursue security missions that also facilitate the national security of the United States. Please. Thank you, I'm Emily Greenspan, I'm with Oxfam, and you mentioned the relevance of the extractive industries on the continent, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what the U.S. government and perhaps EU could do to promote transparency and good governance in the extractive industry. Uh, there is, as you know, an extractive industries uh, initiative that is trying to deploy uh, the lessons of a number of countries, uh, Norway not least among them, that has succeeded uh, in harnessing significant uh, natural resources, particularly in oil and gas, uh, in a way that builds sustainable resources uh, for the nation to deal with education and health and uh, water and infrastructure. Norway has no problems with water. I mean the problems uh, that d many other developing countries face. There have been significant uh, gas uh, discoveries off of Tanzania. There are some potentially promising uh, oil discoveries in Kenya and in Uganda. Uh, and in all three cases, uh, I think it's critical 
that they be developed in a way that is environmentally responsible, that is sustainable, uh, and that contributes uh, to the long-term security uh, of the nations. Um, and there are, um, sadly, counterexamples, uh, not just on the continent but around the world, uh, of countries where those resources uh, did not contribute uh, to strengthening the, the health and the education and the welfare uh, of their countries. So I do think that the EU and the United States has an absolutely central role to play here. We should not shy from a values agenda that says that it is our belief that transparency and democracy, a predictable rule of law, an accountable government, an inclusive uh, economic system uh, is the best path forward. Uh, and we have competitors, uh, vigorous competitors, who are increasingly visible, in some cases dominant in Africa, um, who do not uh, put those uh, values priorities at the fore as they seek uh, development partnerships. And I think we need to continue uh, to stand for what I believe is ultimately in the best interests uh, of human societies. Democracy is not an American idea. It was a Greek idea. Uh, and they're demonstrating just how robustly they can engage in democracy here on a regular basis. Um, and um, African nations and societies have to develop and deliver their own solutions. Uh, but I do think uh, transparency, accountability, uh, and, in and inclusivity uh, in governance and democracy and security are absolutely essential. And as those new resources are uh, developed and exploited, um, we have a critical role to play in ensuring they're done in an appropriate way. Senator, Please. we have time for two more questions. My question is, of all you saw in Kenya, what worried you the most, and how do you see U.S. policy addressing it? What worried me uh, the most? Um, there are uh, constant, unrelenting pressures uh, from uh, economic growth, from population growth. Um, that so, just as there have been dramatic, uh, there's been dramatic progress across the region in Zanzibar, in malaria, for example, uh, in improving uh, child health and child health outcomes, in fighting um, the scourge of HIV AIDS across the region and the continent. We have invested billions of dollars in these um, elements of the Global Health Initiative. Um, as we've made progress, there's also been um, demographic shifts and economic shifts that rob the promise of that progress. Uh, there is continued urbanization. Um, Nairobi is even bigger, even more sprawling, even more dense, uh, and the efforts of the government to deliver on infrastructure um, are barely keeping up with it, really not keeping up with it. And that's true across all three, across Kampala and, uh, and uh, Nairobi and Dar. Uh, in all three countries, we also got to go, we went north to Gulu uh, to look at LRA recovery. We went to Eldoret to look at um, some of the post-2007-2008 election violence uh, recovery effort, uh, a great group, uh, Youth We Can, and to look at an agriculture research station. Uh, so I'm conscious of the tension between rural and urban. Um, but urban areas are areas where traditional culture is lost, uh, where um, there is an opportunity for insecurity, uh, bred of hopelessness uh, and of density. Um, there is also great opportunity. Uh, there are huge uh, masses of young people um, who, with education, with opportunity, could be engaged uh, in delivering that enormous opportunity uh, forward. But we are in a race against time. And if the institutions of governance uh, in Nairobi and in the country of Kenya are not improved upon, if this next election is not one in which the people can have confidence, uh, I, I am very worried about the prospects uh, for the people of Kenya. Um, a lot of the violence uh, uh, in 2007, 2008 was because there was no confidence in the judiciary. Uh, the United States had a comparably close election in 2000, um, where it was decided by 500 hanging chads in Florida and then ultimately by our Supreme Court by one vote. Um, it took us um, more than 200 years, uh, a very divisive and difficult and painful civil war and lots of other contests to get to a place where we have any confidence uh, in our system. It is not easy. Uh, and it is um, perhaps expecting too much to expect a robust and independent judiciary that can stand in the torrential uh, winds uh, of a divisive election. But I was impressed with the strength and determination of many of the national leaders in Kenya who are trying to make that progress in this race against time. Please, if I could. One last question. Is that okay. And then we begin the Votorama on the Farm Bill, which will dominate the rest of the day. Why don't you stay a little longer? Ugoju, 
of uh, South East South Professionals of Nigeria. Yeah, I was in Arusha a few weeks ago for the ADB meetings, and I can say that uh, what you said about Tanzania is true. But the point I'm going to look at is with regards to demonstration effect. You know, in uh, Africa, or sub saharan Africa, look at Rwanda has uh, done well, and then uh, Botswana is doing all right. But one country, even though it's not in East Africa, which uh, if they really get their acts together, will uh, be a good example to the rest of sub saharan Africa is Nigeria. So I want to find out whether you've been to Nigeria recent or whether you have any plans of uh, coming to Nigeria because I think uh, there's a lot uh, you could be able to do there. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the question essentially is, have I been to Nigeria? Do I recognize its uh, global importance? Uh, and am I hopeful for its prospects? Um, yes, in fact, uh, my first trip uh, to Africa as the chair of the subcommittee was with uh, Senator Isaacson. We went to Nigeria, Benin, and Ghana. Uh, and there are uh, enormously hopeful developments across the continent. Uh, Botswana, for example, is one country uh, that harnessed uh, remarkable natural resources in its diamonds uh, and has managed to sustain a significant double-digit growth, a multi-party democracy, a robust society, uh, and has begun to take over a partnership in the fight against HIV AIDS. Uh, we've been able to build in partnership with the Botswana government a strong uh, institutions and systems. Uh, the outcomes of the last Nigerian elections uh, were hugely encouraging. Uh, the role that the Electoral Commission played, uh, the role uh, that the judiciary uh, and that some in national leadership were able to play in ensuring a free and fair election, uh, I think uh, were absolutely uh, inspiring. And uh, in the West African community, uh, the outcomes in Cote d'Ivoire and Nigeria uh, are bending in the right direction. Um, not to be overlooked is Benin, uh, which uh, for decades uh, really struggled uh, with poor governance and with uh, enormous institutional difficulties, and today has had several free and fair elections, is an MCC partner, uh, and is a potential real development leader uh, in the West African region. But Nigeria, uh, along with Kenya and South Africa, is really one of the three absolute linchpins of the continent. Its strength, its movement towards transparency in extractive industries, towards a strong and robust and independent um, uh, legislative uh, structure uh, at the state level and then federally, uh, and a successful uh, press and uh, judiciary. If these things happen, uh, if the initial promise of Good Luck Jonathan's administration is delivered upon, if the North is included in development opportunities and the North-South tensions are addressed, uh, there's no limit to how um, important and powerful a regional leader and a global leader Nigeria uh, can be. Um, much like Kenya, uh, it is at a tipping point uh, where movement in those directions is, is essential. Uh, and much uh, like all three of the countries I referenced, uh, there are values issues uh, around transparency, uh, commitment to democracy, uh, and an ability uh, to have an inclusive economy uh, that are essential, um, that if we can make progress together towards them, uh, we can make an, an enduring difference uh, for the whole continent. I recently uh, met with the Nigerian ambassador um, and uh, have every intention of returning to Nigeria should I continue to be able to serve in our own Senate. <laughs> um, and, and let me close on this point. Uh, the Nigerian diaspora community, the Kenyan diaspora community, the Liberian diaspora community in my own home state of Delaware uh, is strong and is enthusiastic about partnering uh, in making entrepreneurship possible, in investing uh, in their nations of origin. And this is an opportunity we should not miss. Uh, it is part of the presidential policy directive, uh, but one of our great strengths as a country is that we have welcomed and included uh, peoples from all over the world, and we should be engaging uh, with diaspora communities from Tunisia and Egypt, from South Africa and Nigeria, uh, from Kenya and Tanzania, in a way that allows us uh, to use some of America's greatest strengths, its openness, its tolerance, its entrepreneurship, its creativity, and its education. Uh, if we do all that, if we take advantage of all of these strengths and opportunities, I'm very optimistic uh, about the possibilities for our partnership for this decade and for the century. Thank you very much. Thanks for chance to be with you. Uh, just very quickly, uh, Senator, thank you so much for what covered, I think, so much, but in very concrete ways and meaningful ways. Um, uh, I think everyone here um, will join me in, in uh, 
being very impressed for one, but also um, very, very glad for your leadership in the Senate and, and that voice in the Senate with Senator Isaacson uh, making, making the case for Africa. Um, so please thank me and we'll let you go to the farmer. <laughs>